I'm now delighted to introduce Rajat Mukherjee, Principal Strategic Consulting at CITEL, our webinar presenter today. Rajat has more than 20 years of professional experience as an industry and academic statistician and brings a range of expert knowledge to CITEL's customers. This includes work in pattern rec recognition problems for devices and biomarker discovery, Bayesian clinical trials, adaptive designs, and design and analysis of complex epidemiological studies. The topic of today's webinar is resolving prior data conflict, and it's well acknowledged that the late phased clinical trials in rare and complex diseases can benefit enormously by borrowing from historical data. While in the frequentist framework, borrowing amounts to pooling via appropriate matching, in the Bayesian framework, this is achieved via the use of informative priors that are constructed using historical data. Importantly, arbitrary borrowing from historical data can have detrimental effects on the operating characteristics of the design. So in today's webinar, Rajat will present two ways to control the influence of the prior data on the posterior inference under prior data conflicts. I'm now delighted to hand over to Rajat for the presentation. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. Um, I just wanted to uh, personally say hi and welcome to everybody. Uh, and also uh, so that you can uh, put a face to the name. So here we get started with this uh, seminar uh, on resolving prior data conflict. And as Liz mentioned, uh, that uh, borrowing from historical or external data is often uh, very attractive. Um, and, uh, and in the Bayesian framework, we'll be talking about the Bayesian framework today. And in the Bayesian framework, this is done using an informative prior. There are problems. Um, what if the prior uh, for a parameter of interest, let's say the effect size uh, of a particular drug or a therapy, um, they do not agree uh, for the historical data, the information coming from the historical data and the information coming from the current trial data. What if there is a conflict? Then obviously um, this could um, result in inflated type one error or even type two error. And we'll look at some of the ways uh, to resolve this conflict and then control the influence of the prior or that is the historical data on uh, the posterior density that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that uses both the historical data and the current data to make inference on the parameter of interest. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, I'll introduce the problem. We'll look at two different uh, ways to um, control the influence of these priors. One is the meta-analytic predictive uh, prior. Now, these are uh, mostly suitable when you have historical data in terms of metadata. So summary statistics from uh, several studies uh, put together to uh, give you a informative prior. The other is uh, the power prior and the discount function approach, which is more suitable when you have patient level data. So this is more suitable if a particular sponsor is uh, has a phase two study and they want to use um, the, some of the phase two study uh, to uh, then construct an informative prior that would, could be used uh, for a phase three study, for example. We'll look at uh, operating characteristics of such design where borrowing is happening, and then we will uh, uh, discuss a few uh, important topics uh, related uh, to this uh, borrowing methodology. So um, why borrow? So there are recent examples, uh, especially in rare diseases. Uh, so for example, in a rare form of cancer, there have been recent examples of drug approval based on a single arm studies uh, using external real world data uh, derived control arms. In medical devices, especially uh, diagnostic devices that are um, that are based on machine learning and artificial intelligence, they obviously evolve over time. Other medical devices also evolve over time with technology. And to be able to show substantial equivalence with a predicate device, which is already in the market, this borrowing is appealing. Why do a, a full-fledged uh, randomized controlled trial when there is already a predicate device in the market. 
pediatric studies, uh, there have been many examples where uh, people have looked at uh, borrowing from adults studies into the pediatric studies, again, to uh, keep the sample size of such studies uh, to a limited number. As uh, Liz mentioned in her introduction, uh, in the in the frequentist framework, this uh, borrowing is often done using patient patient level data and by appropriate matching and pooling. Uh, for example, using propensity scores for matching. In the Bayesian framework, it's a little different. You don't use actually patient level data, but you use the entire uh, historical data set to then construct informative priors that could be then used for the uh, Bayesian inference for the current trial data. What are the concerns? Typical concerns are, what if there's a conflict in terms of the effect size per arm or differences uh, between the two arms. So you could think of effect size as differences between two arms or uh, in terms of the end point, what if the distribution of the end point is a mismatch between the historical and the current trial? And then the next question is how much information from the historical data to borrow and how to control this level of borrowing? So what is prior data conflict? So prior data conflict is basically when the distribution of the effect size in terms of the endpoint of interest do not agree between the historical and current data. Under this prior data conflict, uh, Bayesian inference can lead to inflated expected type one and type two errors, which we'll see uh, with the preceding examples. There are certain uh, known methods for resolving such conflicts. Um, one is the commensurate prior. Uh, the references are given here. Um, the next is the robustification of meta-analytic predictive priors. Um, and this, is, uh, this can be achieved using the R package R-BEST, which can be uh, downloaded from uh, the CRAN website. And the use of discount functions. Again, the R package here is base DP, D for uh, discount, and uh, P for priors. Um, so we will be mostly looking at this robustification of meta analytic predictive priors, which I will introduce in um, the next slide. And then we'll also be talking about the discount function. And these are, again, two different methods which are suitable for two different settings. The meta analytic priors can be derived from metadata and then the discount function is more appropriate when we have patient level historical uh, data. So let's uh, look at the meta-analytic predictive priors, how to construct them first. Suppose uh, we have uh, metadata from uh, capital H studies, Y1, Y2 up to YH, each estimating a trial specific parameter theta H. Let's say theta star is the trial specific parameter for the current trial that we are designing. This is a key assumption, uh, the assumption that all these theta one up to theta capital H and theta star, they all come from a common distribution. Uh, in this case, we are just looking at a normal, normally distributed uh, endpoint. So we are assuming a normal prior for these thetas and the common mean with uh, mu and uh, heterogeneity parameter tau square. And we'll talk about how to really choose these priors in, uh, uh, in a later slide. This is the likelihood, so given each theta h from the hth study, uh, this is the likelihood, which is a normal theta h sigma h square. If we assume that the heterogeneity parameter tau square is known, uh, which is a, not a very realistic assumption, but if we for the moment assume that it's known and if we use a local uniform prior, so that is a uniform prior which is basically holds most of its mass, uh, uh, which reflects the likelihood uh, of the data. So if we assume such a uniform prior on the mean 
and let's say the heterogeneity parameter is known, then the posterior distribution or the posterior predictive distribution can be written down uh, like this. So note here, there's this uh, tau square. If we were going to write down just the posterior distribution, it wouldn't have this tau square um, factor here, but this is the predictive posterior distribution. So it can be written down explicitly. And this can be achieved using a generalized linear model with fixed effects. Now, if we assume that uh, tau square is itself a random parameter, so we assume in a full Bayesian model hyperparameters for sigma and tau, and of course for mu, uh, then we, we are looking at a, um, a, a, a random effects model. Uh, and then uh, basically, if we use a generalized linear model with random effects, then we can derive the posterior distribution of theta star, which is the parameter of interest for the current trial. Now, once we get the posterior, um, of course, we are using uh, MCMC runs here. So from the MCMC runs, we can look at the histogram of the posterior distribution of theta star. Now, in order to be able to use that prior, so this is again a prior that we are constructing. So this is in terms of a histogram now, but in order to use this prior in a meaningful Bayesian framework, or inference, we have to give it an explicit uh, form, a mathematical form. Um, this could be achieved using kernel density estimators, but a more suitable way to uh, approximate this is by a mixture of K conjugate distribution. So for example, K normal distribution with appropriate weights uh, WK. Let's um, define this call this pi theta of d naught, d naught for historical data. So this is how we, so in, the, in this slide, we are deriving this MAP or the, or the meta-analytic predictive prior. So this is the meta-analytic predictive prior. Now that's not enough because now we have to control the influence of this prior based on conflicts between the historical and the current uh, data. Now, how do we resolve that? This is, re this is resolved using robustification of this uh, map prior. How do we robustify? We take a, a robust prior. This is a non-informative robust prior. And we'll talk about how to choose this uh, robust prior. Uh, in a bit. So we weigh it um, accordingly. Um, and then this is the MAP prior. And this is, uh, this is the prior that we would then use for the current uh, trial. So this uh, WR, the weight on the robust prior, um, it, um, it's the prior probability uh, or belief that the current trial differs systematically from the historical data. Now, remember that this, um, this MAP prior can be approximated by a, a weighted um, sum of, uh, or a mixture of um, conjugate priors, right? So if this can be approximated by a mixture of conjugate priors, so then, uh, so the whole thing can also be approximated by a mixture of conjugate priors. Now, once we approximate this by the mixture of conjugate priors, that's our starting point, that's our informative prior. And then once we get the current trial data, we can derive the posterior. The posterior also is a mixture of conjugate posteriors and with updated weights. And this is where uh, the new weights are based on component-wise prior data co conflict. So for, for example, if we have a current data given by this is the sample size, this is the sample mean and the sample uh, variance, then basically this, these weights, so we start off with a weight and then these weights are redistributed in the posterior and it's proportional to the likelihood likelihood uh, calculated at the robust mean, for example, and divided by the likelihood um, at the kth component. 
So this is this is a screenshot of our internal tool to carry out these uh, designs and inference. So I'm showing you this because this is the this is a metadata. This is we are looking at uh, the log hazard ratio from different studies. So in the light blue, you will see th these are the these are the log hazard ratio estimates obtained uh, with the standard errors. These are obtained from the studies, and then if we fit a generalized random effects model, these are the the dark blue ones are the estimates that are produced by these uh, random effect uh, generalized linear model, and this is what the MAP prior looks like. If we do the histogram. Uh, from the MCMC runs of the posterior uh, uh, distribution. This is what the histogram looks like. And then the question is, how do we approximate it by a density, a proper density uh, that can be explicitly written down? So in the in the uh, in the MAP prior approach, this is what's done. You fit component different components here. I selected three components. Why I selected three components? Because if you look at this metadata carefully, I can probably look at three different clusters. So I think, you know, uh, so that's why I decided to um, have three components here. The number of components could also be done automatically. So basically that controls the, num the degree of smoothness of this density estimation. And as and, and then this uh, smoothness is measured by the cool black light blur distance um, divergence measure. And as K increases to infinity, this uh, divergence measure goes down to zero quite rapidly. So here you see these three components. The first component has around 60% weight, the second component around 35% weight, and the uh, third component has around 6% weight. So these are the different weights. And again, these are the different means of the three um, conjugate uh, components and the standard deviations. Uh, the lastly, what we get from here is the MAP prior. The MAP prior has a mean of this is log hazard ratio scale. It has a mean of negative 0.13. This is the standard deviation and the quantiles here. The effective sample size. Uh, so these studies have different number of, this is all in terms of number of events. Uh, so the effective sample size is also in terms of number of events. They have different number of events coming from different studies, but the effective sample size uh, for the MAP prior is 185 events. So this is just how to construct the MAP prior. Next is how to robustify it. So what we did here, we added a uh, we added a, a robust component with 20% weight here, and the mean of the robust component is zero. So it's always advisable to have this robust component uh, more leaning towards the null value or the null hypothesis. And that's why we chose a mean of zero for the robust component. And here you see the robust component. This is the one in purple and it's shifted with the mean towards zero. And it's also uh, has a big, uh, rather big variance compared to the other components. What it does, is the, the MAP prior that we had earlier constructed uh, after robustifying, this is what it looks like. You see that the right tail here is much heavier. So there's a lot more mass towards the null value. After robustifying, uh, this is what the uh, final MAP prior obtained is. This is with a mean of negative uh, 0.13 and the standard deviation is a little bit higher and the effective sample size comes down uh, by around uh, uh, 20%. Just to compare uh, the two, so the first one, the green one is just the MAP prior and the second one, the orange one is the MAP prior with the robust component and you see again the heavier tail here. So th these are some more information here. You see the effective, uh, effective sample size uh, from 185. We were able to uh, bring it down to 153. If you increase the weight on the robust prior, it can be uh, controlled 
um, even further. So if you increase 2.3, the effective sample size will come down more. This is a screenshot of the user interface of our tool. Um, just to again show you, this is how we read in the um, different studies uh, the hazard ratios from the different studies, number of events in the control group, number of events in the treatment group. Now, this is where um, this is where one has to be careful about choosing priors. I'll get to this um, in the next slide. Uh, this is the mixture distribution model. How many components to choose? This could be automatic or it could be uh, user um, input. So for example, uh, in this example that I showed, there were three clusters, so I chose a uh, number of mixture components to be three. This is the robustification add robust component. Um, yes or no, if you click that, and then what is the robustification weights? And then some of the computational para parameters, uh, for example, uh, the number of MCMC runs, and what is the diff uh, there are two different ways of ESS uh, computation. Um, you can find the details in the references uh, given in the slide, um, in the previous slide. Now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, choosing the priors for the parameters of interest. Now, um, so the first is, how do we choose a prior for the heterogeneity per, uh, per, uh, parameter? So you can choose a high heterogeneity parameter if you see there's a lot of heterogeneity between these studies. Um, now, in a random effects uh, framework, so I'm just going to read out from this um, uh, help file for our tool, uh, the prior distribution for the heterogeneity parameter tau is taken to control the degree of prior belief on the relevance of the historical data, relevance towards the current trial. For example, on the log uh, odds ratio scale, and uh, obviously uh, we can also talk about the uh, log hazard ratio scale here, using a half normal distribution with a standard deviation of one, puts around 5% probability that tau is greater than two. So tau is especially large, which corresponds to 5% chance that the historical data carries no relevance about theta star in the new trial. So if we say, if we choose high heterogeneity, it will have 5% probability that historical data has no relevance about theta star. If we choose low heterogeneity, it will have 0.5% probability that the historical data has no relevance about theta star. We can also put in uh, a known tau if there were, um, if there were, you know, a single study or there were a couple of studies and they were, you know, and 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 they were conducted, uh, you know, by let's say by the same uh, sponsor in the same population. Then in those uh, rare situations, we could also use a known tau. How about the prior for uh, mu? So there are two options here, the skeptical prior and the enthusiastic prior. The skeptical prior, this puts around 5% um, chance that the effect size exceeds the minimally clinical relevant uh, effect size. I'm going to go back to the uh, UI, and here you also see there is a place for um, putting down the what is what is the minimal effect. Um, uh, relevant effect size. In the enthusiastic case, this ensures that 5% chance that the effect size is less or equal to zero. So now that, now that we know how to create a MAP prior and then how to robustify, let's see the effects on the posterior density of the, of the population mean that's what uh, we are uh, talking about in this case as an example. Um, and then in the, in the top panels, you will see there is, this is the weight of zero. So there is no uh, robustification. Um, and then we take a um, weight of uh, 20% uh, for the uh, robust uh, prior. And this is the animation which I'm going to start here. So in the, in the top, in the top panel, you'll see, so this is, so, and for the control arm, let's say, you know, there is no difference. There's no conflict between historical and the current data. The control arms of the two studies or of the, of the uh, metadata 
reflects very well with the control arm on the current study. For the treatment arm, so this is the white line, this is the likelihood of the current trial data, and the dashed line is the, um, is the prior that uh, we had constructed uh, the MAP prior. We see as the prior goes away from the likelihood, uh, the posterior in the top panel also shifts away from the likelihood. So it's not resolving the prior data conflict. And you can see that in terms of the posterior difference, and that's our uh, inference step. Uh, so it carries a lot of influence from the prior uh, density. On the other hand, if we robustify, you see uh, as the prior goes away from the likelihood, the posterior still sticks pretty close to the current data likelihood. Uh, so nullifying the effect of the prior as there's uh, conflict uh, increases. So the conflict here has been uh, uh, quantified in terms of the standardized effect size coming from the uh, historical data. And again, you see for the inference, this is the posterior density of the difference between the two arms um, as the prior goes away uh, from the uh, from the uh, likelihood, uh, the posterior density of the difference uh, still uh, is closely uh, is close to the likelihood and uh, nullifies the influence of the uh, informative prior. So that's the one approach if we had uh, meta-analytic uh, or metadata and how to create these meta-analytic predictive priors, and how to robustify and uh, resolve the conflict. The other is uh, the power prior and the discount function approach. Um, so this is the uh, Ibrahim et al. in uh, Statistics in Medicine 2015. That's the reference. Let's say the parameter of interest is theta. Um, we denote the historical data by D naught and the current by D. Uh, these are the two different likelihoods. We start from an initial non-informative prior. We know nothing about uh, theta. So it's um, pi naught theta and obtain the power prior as, so this is the power prior, so given the historical data and an alpha, which is a, a power prior, so this, this, um, this power prior is nothing uh, but proportional to the likelihood of the historical uh, data raised to the power alpha uh, times the initial non-informative prior. Now this alpha is a scalar uh, between zero and one. In the original article by Ibrahim and colleagues, um, they also deal with the situation where this alpha uh, could be um, uh, inferred upon in a full Bayesian model. So you would assume hyperparameters uh, for alpha. In this situation, we are assuming this is a scalar, unknown scalar that would be estimated by uh, looking at uh, the uh, similarity or dissimilarity uh, between the historical and the current data. So if we start with this uh, prior, uh, then the posterior of theta once the current data is available, so given uh, the historical data, the current data, and this alpha scalar uh, is just proportional to this uh, product of the current uh, likelihood, um, the historical likelihood raised to the power alpha, and then the non-informative uh, starting prior. If we had uh, K historical uh, studies, then um, we would have a, a scalar uh, alpha parameter for each of those, and then uh, the uh, and then the um, power prior could be uh, just written as a product of these likelihoods from each of the studies um, uh, to raise to the power alpha k times the initial starting uh, non-informative prior. Now, for conjugate cases, the power prior simply inflates the variance on the uh, informative prior. So, for example, in the normal case uh, where uh, we have a known variance, um, so this is the uh, sample mean from the historical data, and this is the sample mean from the uh, current data. These are the distributions. And then if we look at the posterior uh, distribution of mu, given uh, the current, uh, the historical data, the alpha and the sigma, then this is the, post uh, the 
the uh, the informative prior that we obtain the power prior that we obtain is nothing but a normal distribution uh, with a variance sigma squared divided by alpha by uh, alpha times n zero remember this alpha is a scalar between zero and one so what it does is it inflates the variance here this uh, product of alpha times n zero n zero is the um, information from the historical study uh, or the sample size from the historical study that we are using this n0 star this is the effective sample size borrowed from the historical data and now we'll see how to control how to estimate this alpha based on similarity and dissimilarity or uh, similarity or dissimilarity between the historical data and the current data um, once we get an estimate uh, for alpha then we would be able to have a control on this N0 star, which is the effective sample size borrowed from the historical data. So this is what happens. This inflation of variance is what happens for um, conjugate priors. Um, in this case, we talked about the normal distribution with the known variance. In general, though, um, what, what it does, this alpha, uh, what it does is that the heaviness of the tail of the power prior is inversely proportional to alpha, right? So as alpha goes to one, that is full borrowing, then we can have a nice normal distribution with the tails, uh, size of the tails or the heaviness of the tails as expected. But if alpha was a uh, small, uh, so we are borrowing less, then uh, those uh, tails get heavier. So how do we how do we estimate this alpha? This is done um, using a discount function, use of discount function. We start with a non-informative prior uh, for the theta uh, from the historical uh, study, so theta d naught, and then uh, for uh, theta d for the current uh, study parameter of interest. Uh, we start with two different uh, non-informative priors, update them with both the historical and current data separately. Once we have the historical data and the current data, so given uh, these uh, uh, data sets, uh, we can look at the posterior probability that theta d naught is systematically different from theta d. Uh, we'll have to turn this into a two-sided uh, probability. So this is how we trans transform it to a two-sided difference. So note that if uh, p hat uh, was uh, was zero, then uh, the ultimate p hat would uh, still be zero. And if p hat was one, uh, it would still be uh, zero. Around a p hat of around 0.5, which shows that there's a lot of similarity between uh, historical and current data, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, close to one. So now that we uh, now that we have um, calculated this p hat, we use a discount function. There are a lot of uh, d discount functions that one can use. Here we are uh, showing an example where we used a viable um, CDF with shape three and scale 0.5. This is the viable CDF. This is the stochastic comparison or the p hat that we just calculated. We can calculate this. <coughs> excuse me, uh, separately for the treatment arm and for the control arm. Let's say for the tre treatment arm, the stochastic comparison was close to zero. The p hat that we calculated uh, came close to zero. And then according to this uh, discount function, we wouldn't borrow. Um, so the alpha discount parameter would be around zero. So that means we are not borrowing much for the treatment arm. On the other hand, for the control arm, this is again an example. Let's say the p hat came around 25.25, uh, uh, then we would uh, probably, according to this uh, discount function, we would borrow around 20% uh, from the historical uh, control arm. So this is again uh, discounting for contamination from historical uh, uh, treatment arm. Uh, so again, there is no contamination here. So I'm going to start this animation again. Um, again, there is no contamination for the control arm. For the treatment arm, this is the likelihood of the endpoint of interest uh, or the parameter of interest. And this is the, the dashed line is the prior and the solid line is the posterior that we obtained by mixing the likelihood and the prior. <clears throat> 
So here you see if we have no discount, then the prior difference obviously is influenced by the informative prior that we are using. But if we use a, um, a viable, uh, that viable CDF as the discount function that we just saw, the influence of the prior is nullified as there is more uh, discrepancy between the current and the uh, historical data. So let's look at some operating characteristics of uh, using such uh, borrowing and designing studies uh, where uh, borrowing is uh, happening. So the scenarios for these numerical studies, uh, we, uh, for the historical um, data, we assume that the control um, mean is control arm mean is zero. Uh, the, the, the standard deviation is always sigma. Um, treatment. Um, is delta H, uh, and for the current uh, trial, again, for the control arm, there's no contamination, there is no uh, dissimilarity, they agree. So the control arm uh, for the current trial is also zero, um, and then for the treatment arm, uh, mu T is delta T. We'll assume that uh, sigma is known. Um, sample sizes for the historical as well as the current uh, will uh, we'll fix that to uh, 50. For calculating um, type one error, we will uh, take this uh, delta H, the treatment mean from the historical data, divided by the uh, standard deviation, so the standardized effect size uh, between 0.1 and 1, while holding uh, delta, this, this should be delta T, apologies, uh, so delta T by sigma to be zero. So for type one error, we are simulating scenarios where the current trial has a effect size of zero, but then uh, the historical data has uh, an effect size which varies from 0.1 to one. Um, so this is the contamination that's coming from the historical data. Uh, for uh, Power calculations, uh, we vary both the historical standardized effect size and the current uh, between zero and one. <clears throat> the borrow control parameters for the alpha discount, that's uh, fixing the uh, discount function. We'll fix that to viable shape uh, three and we'll vary the scale from 0 0.2.5 to 0.8. For robustification of MAP priors, um, we'll use a robust component weight, uh, which varies from 0 0.05, 0 0.2 to 0.5. And we'll look at the operating characteristic under these scenarios. So this is type one error and expected sample size. On the left, you have the power prior and the alpha discount approach. On the right, you have the MAP robustification approach. Now let's first look at um, uh, full borrowing. So we are borrowing everything uh, without controlling for the influence uh, uh, of the prior, uh, even if there is a conflict. Now, if that happens, this expected sample size, they are both at 50. Um, you see uh, the dashed line here, the purple line, and then here the, uh, the maroon line, they're both at 50. Uh, that's the expected sample size. The scale of the expected sample size is on the right. Uh, on the left is the scale of the type one error. What we see here that if the prior contamination, so this on the x-axis is the prior contamination effect size, it's standardized effect size basically for the historical study. When it's around zero, then everything is fine. As it increases, this is the type one error, um, which is uncontrolled. Um, as the contamination increases. So there's no control of the type one error uh, without, um, uh, without uh, discounting, that is full borrowing. Now we uh, look at use of discount function. Um, as the scale of this viable CDF increases, uh, there is more heavier discounting. So this is light discounting. On the other hand, this is heavy discounting. So light discounting, we see uh, the sample size, the expected sample size that's borrowed from the historical data decreases quite rapidly as the contamination increases. What about the type one error, this green line? The type one error is all good uh, beyond a certain point. Then around a sweet spot, it uh, or not so sweet spot, it increases 
above this red dashed line is the 2.5% mark. It uh, goes slightly and then as this contamination increases further, it comes down. So by simulations, we can uh, we can decide what is the level of uh, uh, discounting and uh, we would need um, under certain scenarios. And that would also help us to uh, pre-specify what is the discount function we are using. So let's look at this um, heavy discounting. This heavy discounting does a fairly good job in uh, preserving the type 1 um, error at 2.5%. The same happens with the robustification. Uh, if we do not robustify, that is the robust weight is zero, uh, then the uh, type 1 error um, increases uh, uh, without any control. Uh, and then we take a, a, a small robustification weight and then a big one, and then we see how, um, how these um, type 1 error is pretty much uh, is quite well controlled if we take a heavy discounting function given by this light orange line. In terms of uh, power, uh, I think the most uh, interesting thing here is comparison uh, with a design uh, that is not borrowing anything and that's given by this uh, white um, dotted line. Th these are the power. So this is on the left is the power uh, prior alpha discount approach. On the right, again, the map robustification approach. And as we see, uh, if we um, if we use these discount functions from uh, light discounting to heavy discounting, we see how um, you know the power comes down but still there is a benefit um, around, uh, you know, when the effect size is between, uh, is, a, is a moderate to uh, good effect size, there can be substantial um, increase in power uh, or, uh, you know, uh, or uh, lessening the burden on the sample size. The same happens uh, with the MAP robustification. Just a few points to uh, discuss. Um, so prior data conflicts can lead to uncontrollable uh, type 1 error, as we saw. Adaptive borrowing. So this is adaptive borrowing because um, once uh, we can only decide, um, we can only decide on what is the borrowing uh, in terms of the discount function or how much to robustify, uh, we can only decide or the, for the MAP prior, the robustification, the reweighing only happens once the uh, current data trial is, uh, current trial data is available. On the other hand, for the alpha discount, we would definitely use the current trial data to decide on what is the level of the conflict. And based on that level of the conflict and the discount function that's chosen, uh, we would decide on this alpha parameter. So that's why we call it adaptive borrowing strategies and they help in resolving prior data conflicts by controlling the influence of the prior on the posterior based on dissimilarity measures. For the discounting, we look at the posterior difference um, for the effect size between the historical uh, and the current data, for example. And for the robustification, we do this posterior reweighing of the mixture components. Both procedures are applicable for single all multi-arm trials. They can be also applied for regression settings uh, with covariates as well as to binomial and time to events endpoints. Now, pre-specification, this, uh, this is for the statistical analysis plan or the protocol. For example, if there was a trial designed in uh, this way, either using the discount function approach or the MAP prior approach, what is the pre-specification needed in the SAP? Uh, for the discount function approach in terms of what is the discount function, uh, so it could be you know, a viable CDF with a scale of three and uh, you know, shape of, uh, shape of uh, three and a scale of uh, point five for example for robustification in terms of what is the non-informative component um, and its weight and we discussed that uh, while look, looking at our internal um, design tool uh, 
planning for a late phase trial uh, should preferably be done blinded to the trial that is trial data that is going to be used as the historical data. Uh, so a lot of lot of uh, sponsors uh, worry about what if um, I'm planning for my pivotal trial and the historical data is not yet in hand? Um, what if the historical data um, doesn't show much promise? Uh, do I really want to borrow from this historical data? On the other side, you know, if the if the historical data shows a very big benefit, but the reality is, uh, you know, it, it's 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 probably a, a false discovery, uh, then, you know, this kind of conflicts uh, uh, can be resolved. So the reason, the reason why I say this should be done preferably blinded to the trial to be used as historical data is because of selection bias. So once you have the historical data, obviously you will want to use part of that data if only the historical data shows treatment uh, benefit, otherwise not. So it's subjected to selection bias to minimize that or nullify that. This is uh, why uh, we, um, uh, we prefer uh, doing the uh, planning for the late phase trial uh, blinded to the uh, historical data. Uh, but um, as pointed out, uh, use of this um, discount function or the MAP robustification not only uh, safeguards against type 1 error, but it also safeguards against type 2 error inflation. Thank you, everybody. That's all I have, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rajat, for the presentation. Um, so we'll now begin um, answering the questions submitted during the presentation. Um, you can still submit questions through the questions panel in your control pane. Um, so Rajat, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, we may not have a chance to answer them all, um, but let's let's um, just just take take the first one. Um, so, when borrowing information, what's the regulatory hurdle for type one error? Can you, do you have any comments or thoughts on that? Right. So, I think it's you know. So, if in the Bayesian framework there is uh, no such thing as a type one error, we look at uh, simulations uh, um, and we sort of. Um, um, look at the expected type one error, but in the frequentist uh, um, uh, sense. So, um, you know, there have been there have been instances where uh, there are a couple of trials uh, that are ongoing that are borrowing from historical data, and we have been able to uh, discuss uh, with uh, CDRH, for example, and. Um, and set not only a maximum to how much historical data would also would be borrowed, but also um, uh, said, look, we are we are uh, we are using this methodology, and we can uh, we can preserve uh, the alpha to around three percent, and that that was fine. So it doesn't always have to be 2.5 percent. Um, obviously, it depends on uh, the application in a in a very rare disease. Uh, you know, uh, regulatory authorities are willing uh, to um, uh, to be flexible in terms of uh, uh, the nominal uh, uh, level of significance. Great, thank you very much, Rajat. Um... So another uh, question here is um, somebody said thank you for the insightful presentation. So that's a, a nice comment. Um, thank you. Despite the robustification of the prior, theoretically it may not be possible to control the type one error over the whole range of parameter unless we increase weight to to robust components so high that it offsets the informative components contribution. However, in that case, we lose the benefit of the Bayesian framework. Mm -hmm. So no borrowing from the prior. So does the robustification really resolve the concern related to type one error inflation? So the so the robustification, you know, the, what we saw with this uh, reweighing. I'm going to go back uh, to this uh, slide. Um, bear with me here. <clears throat> 
so this uh, reweighing, this uh, this uh, this uh, the reweighing, this uh, this looks at so this basically looks at the ratio of the likelihood from the robust uh, mean and the likelihood uh, uh, with these uh, different K components uh, that you're using to approximate uh, the posterior um, uh, the MAP prior. Um, so this this should resolve now obviously if there's a huge conflict uh, it will this uh, the, these weights uh, will uh, become uh, negligible and of course the benefit uh, from borrowing uh, will be minimized so it really depends on how much conflict if there's a huge conflict then you will borrow very little uh, from the historical um, data or studies and if the um, if the uh, conflict is little then you might be able to uh, borrow uh, quite a bit. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Rajat. Um, so this is a, a comment. Um, so meta-analytic predictive priors are based on Bayesian hierarchical, which relies on likelihood principle. Therefore, the methodology is applicable when patient level data is available. Having patient level data allows further relaxation of exchangeability assumptions, for example, um, partial exchangeability. Do you have any sort of comment on that at all? I, I do agree. If, if if you have patient level data, you can always uh, produce uh, metadata and uh, you know uh, go the uh, meta analytic predictive uh, prior uh, route. Uh, so so uh, so obviously um, obviously these two methods uh, can both be applied if the patient level data is available. So very nice comment. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so here's another another interesting question. Um, so um, the 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 the, the um, webinar attendees asked this question and said, for years I've heard about adaptive borrowing, but I've never been comfortable with it. As a subjective Bayesian, I believe the prior should measure our certainties about the population parameters before we analyze the data. If one thinks that way about the prior, then to make the prior depend on the data obscures the meaning of the prior. Can you refer me to any pa a paper that would help me feel more comfortable with adaptive borrowing or any literature? And th this may be one we could we could respond to offline as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then I have one more question here. Um, how can we evaluate agreement between prior and posterior data? So uh, one way is, um, so here again, um, so I'm at the right slide, with the uh, meta-analytic approach, you will, uh, so this reweighing is done proportional to the likelihood. Um, so what is the likelihood uh, at this robust prior? So the robust prior, remember, we were choosing the, you know, more uh, supporting the null uh, hypothesis or the null value, right? So what is the likelihood? Um, and then what is the, what is the likelihood uh, at this robust, pr uh, robust prior um, um, relative to uh, what the historical data is saying, right? So this is how uh, that's controlled. And then in the other approach, it's controlled by uh, looking at this um, uh, this posterior probability of uh, um, probability that the parameter of interest coming from uh, the historical data is uh, is uh, is greater um, than the parameter of interest coming from the uh, the posterior pr probability uh, of uh, difference between the historical and the current data. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rajat. Um, I do actually have um, uh, a couple more questions that have just come in. Do you know of any case studies where these methodologies have been used um, for late phase approval? Yeah, so we have used uh, both these uh, approaches, one for rare diseases and one for uh, uh, devices. And uh, we are currently working on some other uh, proposals in uh, both uh, rare diseases and uh, uh, and also complex diseases. So in complex diseases, obviously, um, you know, Bayesian framework, uh, it's it's not uh, 
it's not as interesting in terms of borrowing from historical studies, but it's more interesting in terms of combining uh, different endpoints and if they are complex. Uh, so, uh, so yes, so we have been engaged in uh, designing uh, late phase studies uh, innovation framework recently. Okay, thank you. Um, and just one final question now, I think that will then, we will then wrap up. Um, so non-inferiority framework sets a long list of requirements for historical data. Can you comment on what kind of requirements there are for the use of historical data for this application? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, I think, uh, I think I'll have to answer back uh, at another time after uh, some thoughts. Yes, yeah, that's on this. fine. We can um, we we can we can pick that up with the um, with the uh, delegate who's asked that question um, offline. Um, so I think that's that's all the questions for today. So um, I'd just like to say thank you again, Rajat, and thank you to everyone um, for attending today's webinar. On behalf of Rajat and the whole Cytel team here, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.